For many years, Robert Fairley considered conventional steam locomotives to be seriously deficient. He believed they wasted weight on unpowered wheels and the wasted energy pulling a tender behind them that only contained fuel and water. He also noted how standard locomotives had a front and a back and weren't meant to be driven in reverse, meaning stations required turntables or away. His answer to this supposed problem was certainly unique to say the least. He designed a double-ended locomotive with every wheel being driven, and in 1864 he patented his design. The water was carried in side tanks and the coal in bunkers on top of them. At each end of the locomotive was a swiveling powered bogey, each having four wheels that were powered by two cylinders. There was a smoke box at each end of the engine, both connected to the same boiler. The initial design only had one firebox, but after problems with draft and steaming, the firebox was swapped out for two separate ones, which worked significantly better. Steam was then transferred to the cylinders through a flexible copper pipe, but as this was prone to breaking, it was replaced with a metal ball and socket joint instead. The first engine was called Little Wonder and was tried on the Festinioch Railway in Wales. After its success, Fairley gave the Festinioch the right to use his design without restriction, in return for them letting him use the line for publicity. He then went on to sell his design all around the world in the US, Canada, Mexico, Ireland, New Zealand, Russia, India, and Burma. The design, however, wasn't by any means means the massive improvement it seemed. The engines had a very small capacity for coal and water, and because of the double-ended design, there was nowhere for a tender to be attached. Some examples were oil-fired instead of coal, which proved to be somewhat more efficient, but not by much. The boiler also ran through the middle of the cab, separating the driver and the fireman, not only making the cab somewhat cramped, but also the controls would be on only one side relative to the driver, making it left-hand drive going one way and right-hand drive going the other. Because the driver was stuck on one side of the cab, it also meant it was harder for them to see signals. The flexible steam pipes were also a problem for a long time as they were prone to leaking. The pipe problem was solved, but decades after the initial problem arose. The bogies themselves were among the biggest of the problems due to the lack of unpowered wheels. The reason locomotives have unpowered wheels at the front is to help guide the engine round curves and stabilize the locomotive. Because Fairley's engines didn't have these, they were prone to riding rough and often to railing. There were also no balance weights at the other end of the bogies to balance out the weight of the cylinders, which also contributed to derailment. An altered version of the design came from Ireland, being called a single fairly. It only used one articulated bogey instead of two and looked more like a conventional locomotive, meaning it had much more room for bigger water tanks and a coal bunker. The swiveling axle also meant the engines could negotiate tighter curves than most. The design was used throughout the UK as well, with one being built on the Festiniog Railway. Today, most diesel locomotives use a similar layout, with two swiveling bogies and all wheels being powered. As for steam locomotives, the design didn't last too long, with its faults undermining any benefits that would be gained by having all the wheels driven. Some American steam locomotives still incorporated swiveling powered bogies, such as the Big Boy, but for the most part, the standard wheel layout worked much better. The Festiniog Railway continues to use fairlies, with three currently in service, one at the National Railway Museum and another under construction. Though they aren't as perfect as Fairley wanted them to be, they're still an intriguing footnote and an interesting experiment that has endured through the history books. Express steam locomotives need a lot of boiler pressure in order to hit express speeds, so increasing the boiler pressure should help improve an engine's top speed, right? Well, the LMS tried it with fury and it didn't really work out so well. So what happened when the LNER attempted to build a high pressure locomotive? The chief engineer at the time, Nigel Gresley, was impressed with the results of high-pressure marine boilers, the kind found on ships, and wanted to apply that to a steam locomotive. A custom boiler was ordered from a company specializing in marine boilers and was fitted to a standard Pacific frame, albeit with an extra set of trailing wheels at the back to accommodate for the extra weight. The boiler was capable of producing roughly 450 psi, as opposed to the 200 psi a standard A1 boiler would produce. After it was built, it was tried on the LNER's non-stop London to Edinburgh service in 1930, managing to keep on time, but steaming relatively poorly when compared to a standard fire tube boiler. Another issue was air leaking into the casing of the engine, which affected performance, but nobody could ever find the cause of the issue. It was trialled on and off for a while, but most tests eventually showed there were few advantages to the marine boiler design, with the engine performing about as well as the other express engines in the LNER's fleet. In 1936, the engine was given a modified A4 
four boiler that would fit the longer frames and a set of new cylinders. The engine was put into service and was reported to have worked fine. The engine still retained the extra axle under the cab, which came with the benefit of a more spacious cab for the driver and fireman. The engine never carried a name, only ever bearing the number 10,000. It was, however, nicknamed the Hush Hush due to its secrecy when being developed, and then later earned the nickname of the Galloping Sausage due to the bulging round shape of the boiler. British Enterprise was considered when it was first built, and British Rail considered the name Pegasus for the rebuilt version, but neither of these names were ever used. It served as an express engine and had very little in the way of accidents. Eventually, it was withdrawn from service in 1959 and scrapped later that year. Like Fury built years before it, 10,000 proved that high-pressure steam was not the way forward in rail locomotion. However, unlike Fury, 10,000 was still able to do the work it was designed for, albeit with underwhelming results. In 1902, the Great Eastern Railway was faced with Parliament passing a bill to build an underground electric railway, later known as the London Underground or the London Tubes. Electric locomotives at the time had great acceleration and could get a heavy train from 0 to 30 miles an hour in under one minute. The Great Eastern Railway, naturally not wanting to lose more passenger traffic, decided to fight the bill by showing that steam was more than capable of matching the speed and power of electric railways. The GER had an engine built entirely to have better acceleration than an electric locomotive to prove steam's efficiency. The result was an 010 tank engine that later came to be known as the Decapod. It was the first locomotive in Britain to have 10 driving wheels, and for a tank engine of the time, it was fairly large or, to put it in more simple terms, was an absolute unit. It was built with three cylinders, a wide firebox, a big boiler to develop the pressure needed for a swift acceleration, carried its water tank in between its frames, and had relatively small driving wheels for a passenger locomotive in order to maximise its tractive effort. With all these features, the engine did what it was designed to do, as it could accelerate a train weighing 335 tonnes from a standstill to 30 miles an hour in just short of 30 seconds, only just beating the speed of other electric locomotives at the time. After demonstrating the engine to Parliament, it was agreed that the Great Eastern was able to meet the transport demands of the public and the bill for the tube train was defeated. After that, the engine struggled to be much use anywhere else on the GER as it was too heavy to safely cross many bridges in suburban areas where it was expected to go, as well as simply being somewhat inefficient to run. By 1906, it was deemed surplus to requirements and was rebuilt with a smaller boiler, smaller firebox, a tender, and had eight wheels instead of ten before it was put to work as a freight locomotive hauling coal trains. It worked fine, but as the design wasn't any better than the current G58 doing the same job, it was scrapped seven years later in 1913. Despite only working for 11 years and being rebuilt for seven of them, the Decapod was a very successful design, fulfilling its purpose in stopping the construction of a rival railway. It's a shame it never really found much use outside of foiling a bill, but it does go to show that, with a little ingenuity, there isn't a whole lot steam can't do. Some locomotives are designed for high-speed passenger work, some are designed for pulling freight, some are designed to do both, and then there's this butte, designed to do one thing and one thing only. PUSH! Hills are a difficult thing for most trains to climb thanks to their weight and the lack of traction on their wheels. This is why banking engines are needed, aka locomotives that push trains from behind to aid them up hills and prevent any wagons from breaking free. In 1919, the Midland Railway was in need of an engine that could perform the role of banking on the Licky Incline, the steepest section of track in Britain. While a few tank engines or a spare goods engine may have covered the job, the Midland Railway wanted a designated engine that was guaranteed to do the job properly and consistently. And so, they built this, number 2290. It had four chunky cylinders, a tractive effort of 43,300 pounds, and was one of the first few locomotives in the UK to have ten driving wheels. While the design was somewhat awkward and didn't have the most impressive steaming characteristics, it more than made up for them with its traction and ability to move a heavy train up a hill. The engine's design also couldn't manage a high top speed, and because it was only ever used for banking work, it was never found out how fast the engine could truly go. Despite 
despite this, the banker was more than suited for the job and ran up and down the Licky Incline for 37 years, clocking up a total of 838,856 miles travelling up and down the line. Which, if my mathematics is correct, means it travelled up and down the Licky roughly 209,000 times. As the engine was such a common sight to railway workers and enthusiasts, it eventually earned the nickname of Big Emma, or more commonly, Big Bertha. Bertha eventually came into the possession of British Railways, who didn't bother giving her a power classification due to her immense traction and the fact that she was never designed for work outside of simply pushing trains up a hill. By 1956, however, BR had produced their 9F class that were primarily used for freight work, and though not as powerful as her, were still some of the most powerful engines running on British rails. With Bertha being a one-of-a-kind locomotive, and thus much harder to maintain thanks to the need for specially made parts, it was decided that Bertha would be retired and replaced with a 9F instead, with several different tank engines occasionally taking over banking duties when needed. Number 92079 was given Bertha's high-power electric headlight, and Bertha was taken to Derby Works where she was scrapped a year later. While Bertha may not have been an amazing engine and was very much a one-trick pony, she still held a place in the hearts of enthusiasts for standing out among all the other banking locomotives around the country. She's perhaps then the shining example example that, even if you're only good at one thing, you can still be memorable. There were many steep gradients on UK railways that often meant heavy trains required the aid of banking engines. One such gradient was the Warsborough Incline that frequently saw heavy coal trains travelling up it. The Great Central Railway that ran the line eventually decided they needed one big dedicated banking engine, similar to Big Bertha on the Licky Incline ran by the Midland Railway, that would be able to push the heavy coal trains up the hill instead of the two 280 engines currently doing the job. The railway considered many options and settled on a Garrett type of locomotive. However, the designs for the engine or the resources needed to build it wouldn't be available until the Great Central Railway became part of the LNER in 1923. The LNER picked up the project and the resulting engine was certainly a sight to behold. The engine was built in 1925 in the span of just three weeks for the modern equivalent of half a million pounds. Oh, and it was absolutely massive, being one of the biggest engines to ever run on British rails. This absolute unit unit used the base wheel arrangement of two class 04 280s with three cylinders at each end, basically giving it the power of two engines in one. It was moved to Mexborough and started its life helping coal trains up the Warsborough Bank, taking the place of the two class 04s that were there initially used for the job. It weighed around 180 tonnes, had a tractive effort of nearly £73,000 and was more than suited for the job. While the engine worked as intended, it was known to have some issues. While the footplate crew had a bigger cab to ride in, they summed up the engine as twice the work for the same sodding pay. The line also went through two tunnels, and with two other engines in front of theirs, crews would often describe travelling through the tunnels as hell due to the amount of smoke, ash, and heat from the other two engines ahead, as well as their own. Gas masks were provided for a short time, connected to a pipe sitting under the frames of the engine so the crew could breathe better. Most workmen, however, opted not to use them over hygiene concerns, instead using the time-honoured tradition of just covering their mouths with a damp hand Chief. Aside from crew complaints, the engine also possessed some minor mechanical faults, with firebox damage after only two years of work and the soft water used in the engine meant the boiler needed to be retubed. It was withdrawn from service in 1930 so it could be modified and have a new firebox fitted. It was put back to work nine months later and continued to work the incline until 1949, with the main issue it faced being steaming problems put down to the poor quality of coal it was burning. In 1948, it was renumbered 69999 by British Rail and in 1949 was moved to the Licky Incline in place of the old banking engine Big Bertha. It was fitted with Bertha's headlamp and while it did the job, footplate crews complained about visibility when buffering up to passenger trains, so it was turned around to run Bunker First instead. Even then, footplate crews had problems seeing ahead, especially after dark, resulting in the engine going back to its original job at Warsborough Bank in 1950. By 1952, it was sent to the Gorton Locomotive Works, where it was to be prepared to work on the Licky Incline again. The engine stayed there for three years while several attempts were made to convert the engine to burn oil instead of coal. 
It was put back into service in June of 1955 on the Licky line, but was sent back to Gorton in October of the same year. British Rail, likely now seeing the engine as more fuss than it was worth, officially withdrew the engine from service in December of 1955 and had it cut up in Doncaster Works early the next year. For what it was, the U1 was fairly successful as it managed to do the work it was designed to do and had a working life of over 30 years. However, its size and shortcomings in steaming were likely what led British Rail to simply choose their 9Fs and several tank engines to do the banking work instead of it. If the design was more refined, then it may have had a longer working life and it might have even been possible for it to work elsewhere on British Rails. But as it stood, it was simply too long, too heavy and too inefficient. All the same though, it must have certainly been one hell of a machine to see in action. Early experimental American steam locomotives never failed to amuse me. As rail traction in the US was starting to develop, many people came forward with ways of improving the designs of locomotives to help increase speed, power, and overall performance. Around the late 1800s, the most common type of locomotive to be used in the United States was the typical Wild West 440 engines, as they were fast, powerful for their size, Lightweight, meaning they could be easily put back on the rails in the event of a derailment, and could run over the rough, quickly laid railroads of the rapidly expanding west. In 1881, a Detroit man by the name of Eugene Fontaine decided to build an engine that would improve upon this design. He had a set of driving wheels mounted above the boiler with the tread pressing on a smaller wheel below it, fixed to a larger driving wheel touching the rails. The idea was essentially an attempt to gear up the power of the driving wheels while using the same amount of boiler pressure. The Grant Locomotive Works took interest in the idea and built two of them. The idea seemed okay on paper, Britain was still using single driving wheeled engines for passenger and express services, and the top wheel was essentially a way of gearing up the main driving wheel to help increase the engine's top speed. But in practice, it was about as effective as painting flames and go faster stripes onto an engine. The step-up ratio was only 28 to 1, which didn't provide much of an increase in performance. On top of that, only two wheels were actively driving the engine as opposed to the standard four on most other contemporary designs, meaning it lacked a lot of the initial acceleration and overall pulling power of other contemporary engines. Not to mention the overall amount of power that was lost transferring the movement from the top wheels to the bottom ones, as both the driving wheels and the top wheels were steel-rimmed, meaning they had little friction and could could very easily slip. A rubber tyre around the wheel may have fixed the problem, but it was never tried. Even if they had tried a tyre though, it was still a bad idea. The engine was trialled on both goods and passenger work, but proved to be inferior in every respect compared to the engines already in use. After three years of trials and experimenting, it was eventually decided that the engines would be sent to the Rome Locomotive Works where they were rebuilt into standard 440s and put back into service. Perhaps with a little refinement, the Fontaine engines could have been of some use, but even then, simply making the driving wheels bigger on the standard 440 would have produced a similar result as intended by Fontaine's design. While it's all well and good trying out different designs and experimenting to find more efficient solutions, Sometimes the more complex and intricate solution isn't the most effective one. In 1917, a man by the name of William Still patented a design for an engine that was both diesel and steam powered. The basic idea was simple. You have a diesel engine running alongside a boiler. The boiler would use waste heat from the diesel engine as well as fuel if needed. The intention was to have the diesel engine run as the main source of power, and have the boiler power a steam engine in the event the diesel one gets overloaded or needs an extra boost in performance. The engine was mostly intended for static use, but of course, someone had the bright idea to try having it power a locomotive. The engine was built in 1926 by Kitson and Company. The basic idea was that steam engines offered a high starting torque while diesel engines offered a high fuel efficiency, and so combining the two seemed like a perfectly reasonable idea, especially as diesel locomotives were still a fairly new technology and hadn't quite been mastered yet. The engine had a 262 wheel configuration and an unusual cylinder arrangement, with the cylinders capable of being powered by both steam and diesel. The boiler was fairly small 
small compared to most contemporary locomotives, but this was made up for with the diesel engine fitted below it. The engine would start by using steam power to get it moving, before starting the diesel injectors and shutting off steam once it hit about 5 miles an hour. The waste heat from the diesel engine helped maintain the pressure in the boiler in the event the extra power was needed. The engine was used by the LNER in 1928 for running goods trains around Leek and York, and was noted for its ability to tackle hills well, once managing to restart a heavy train after stopping on a gradient of 1 in 33. By 1933, it was proven to be reliable enough for daily goods work around York Shed, and regularly took goods to and from dairy coats. Along with its impressive acceleration, it was also very efficient in terms of fuel usage, using roughly a fifth of the fuel a typical coal-burning engine would. The engine, however, wasn't all good news. For an engine of its size, it had a relatively low power output. Not a huge problem for the work it was given, and something that would have been improved if the design was sold commercially, but when engines of the same size can pull bigger loads, it's never a good look. On top of this, the running costs of the locomotive constantly depended on the price difference between coal and oil, and as the engine was powered with diesel while coal was the more abundant fuel source at the time, it made running costs fluctuate significantly. Though the design was successful, by 1934, Kitson & Co was in very poor financial condition, largely thanks to spending nearly 10 years testing the locomotive's design, and as a result, had to abandon the project. They took the engine back and eventually scrapped it in 1935. This, however, wasn't the only attempt made at making a still-style locomotive. In 1925, a design was patented in Switzerland for a steam-diesel hybrid, and another in the US in 1954, though it's unknown if either of these designs went any further than the drawing board. The Soviet Union also tried experimenting with a diesel-steam hybrid. Three different locomotives were produced between 1939 and 1946, each with varying degrees of success. The first was built in 1939, and while it was reliable enough to run passenger services, it was very heavy, rode hard on the rails, and was prone to cracking its cylinders, eventually being put into storage in 1948. The second was reported to only properly function while travelling at about 25 to 30 kilometres an hour, as going any faster would cause premature combustion of the gases used in the engine. It was abandoned in 1941 due to the outbreak of World War II in Soviet territory. The third and final one has little information about its design or performance, other than it was built in 1946, put into storage in 1948, and was reportedly almost a complete disaster. Perhaps then, the still design came at a rather unfortunate time. While being highly fuel efficient and possessing a very impressive ability to start any train it was given, its dependency on a fuel that wasn't commonplace until a few decades later, and its low power output for an engine of its size stalled its development for long enough that it lost its chance to make it big. Maybe it was too ahead of its time, maybe it was just built in the wrong place, who knows. One thing is for sure though, it was certainly one of a kind. Magnus Volk was an interesting fellow. Born in Brighton, England, 1851, he experimented with electricity and built one of the world's first electric cars. He also happens to be the great-grandfather of Joe Volk, a musician specialising in acoustic and folk music. Oh yeah, and he built two weird railways. Magnus Volk's first railway was constructed in 1883. The two-foot gauge railway only followed about a quarter of a mile along the coast of Brighton. In 1884, it was extended a further half mile and re-gauged to two foot 8.5 inches. What made this railway stand out, aside for simply being a tourist attraction, was the fact that it was electric. A Ukrainian inventor, Fyodor Pyotsky, had already built the world's first public electric tramway by 1888, so Volk wasn't the first to come up with the idea, but electric railways were a very new technology and practically unheard of in Britain, and so it got a lot of people's attention very quickly. The original design simply powered the carriages via the rails, the same way a model train set works, but a third rail was later added to improve efficiency. As outstanding as tourists were, some locals were afraid of the railway as the carriages seemed to move on their own without making any noise. Some believed that the carriages were moved by forces beyond our understanding, and were as such the work of the devil. As time went by though, people soon came to realise that the railway was safe and not actually the work of Satan. Volk, however, wasn't content with the length of his railway and wanted to extend it further. 
Unfortunately, the surrounding terrain was unfit to build a railway on, and so the line couldn't be extended. He then realised that the nearby beach was relatively level, and simply decided to build a railway on top of the surf along the shore. The rails consisted of two sets of 2 foot 8.5 inch gauge track being laid parallel with each other, with the outermost rails being about 18 feet apart, making it possibly one of the widest railways in the world. The rails were set on concrete sleepers with deep foundations to ensure they wouldn't be affected by the tide. Power was fed through an overhead power line set up beside the track in order to power the... I hesitate to use the word locomotive. Carriage? Stilty thing? This. It was named Pioneer, but was mainly nicknamed Daddy Longlegs due to its design. The car's weight and height allowed it to traverse the rails whether the tide was in or out, and the fact it was powered by electricity meant there was more space for passengers since there wasn't a great big engine in the way. Because of regulations, Pioneer was also equipped with lifeboats, numerous ship safety features, a qualified ship's captain at all times, and those big round floaty things. This railway unfortunately was short lived, opening in 1896 and closing in 1901. Shortly after it was opened, a storm knocked Pioneer onto its side and left the railway closed until July of 1897. In 1900, several groins were built along the shore, leading to the ground under the rail foundations to become unstable. By the time Volk had amended this, the council were looking into building a beach protection barrier, which would require Volk to divert his railway around it. Volk lacked the funds to do so and ended up just closing the railway. By 1901, the railway was pulled up to make way for the barrier. If you visit the beach, you can still see some of the foundations still in place. After it was closed, Volk decided to extend his original railway to cover a portion of the other railway's original route. In following years, the original line was shortened to make way for development and other such things, but still remains operational to this day, simply living as a tourist attraction that provides a scenic view of the beach. The line usually runs during the summer and remains closed over the winter, with exceptions occasionally made, such as when the Athena B got beached close to the railway in the winter of 1980, where locals and tourists get gathered to witness the mishap as they do. While both railways served as mere tourist attractions, they did help prove that electric railways were at least a viable alternative to steam power. It must have worked, because most of the southern railways in England were converted to run on electricity during the early 1900s. So, if there's anyone you want to thank for electric railways in England, you can start with Magnus Volk. Just don't expect to be going to work on the 810 moving pier anytime soon. Since the invention of the train, it has always been the goal and ambition of many up-and-coming inventors to find ways of making them go faster, either by using different wheel layouts, fuels, or body shapes. Another factor is the means of propulsion, with some using powered wheels, some being cable-driven, and the focus of today's video, some that were powered by propeller. By 1914, aviation development was becoming an ever-expanding point of interest for many countries. Aeroplanes were becoming more and more well-known among engineers and inventors, who all studied and meddled with their own designs, trying to find the perfect power-to-weight ratio to achieve that ever-ambitious goal of flight. Meanwhile, others took aspects of aeronautical design and decided to apply them to other means of transport, specifically their engines and propellers. The fact that an engine and a rotating blade could not only move on its own, but also provide enough thrust to lift itself and a person off the ground and maintain a high speed was enough incentive for some to try using a propeller to move a locomotive. The first example of this was built in 1919 by a German man named Otto Steinitz, who essentially bolted a Dringos aircraft engine to the back of a carriage. Despite its initial crude appearance, during testing, it was found to be capable of reaching between 120 to 150 kilometers an hour. Though it could have been considered a success Success, the design wasn't pursued any further in Germany due to the Treaty of Versailles ban on Germany manufacturing aircraft engines. The next propeller-driven locomotive was built in the early 1920s by a young Russian driver named Valerian Abakovsky. After hearing of Steinitz's propeller-driven carriage, Abakovsky approached the Tambov railway workshop with his idea for a design. The carriage was seen as a way to quickly transport both government officials and sensitive materials, and was given the green light. Soon after, Abakovsky revealed to the world his creation, the Aero Wagon. 
Though small, its aerodynamic shape and light weight meant it could hit up to 140 km an hour, and by July of 1921, the design was deemed a success. During that July, several foreign delegates were visiting Russia, and it was decided that the aero wagon would be the vehicle of choice to take them around the country. After visiting mines, weapons factories, and a theater, at 6.35 pm, around 111 km outside of Moscow, the aero wagon derailed going at 80 km an hour and was blown to smithereens. Six of the 22 people on board died in the accident along with Abakovsky. After the accident, the aero wagon was never rebuilt. The official reason for the accident was said to be the poor condition of the track, and the aero wagon went too fast over a bump in the rails. However, Abakovsky's son believed rocks were deliberately placed on the rails, and that it was a political act of sabotage in an attempt to kill some of the delegates. A Scottish inventor by the name of George Benny used propellers as the primary means of propulsion for his railplane system. His vision was to build a monorail-style track above existing railways to transport passengers, mail, and perishable goods, while slower moving freight trains and local passenger services could continue to use the railway below. The propeller of the railplane was powered with electricity supplied by the monorail track. A 120 meter stretch of this rail system was built in 1929 at Milngave to demonstrate its potential, but the idea never really took off, and by 1937, Benny went bankrupt and the monorail closed down. It wasn't until 1930, however, that the most famous propeller-driven locomotive was built in Germany by Frank Franz Krukenberg, the Scheinen Zeppelin, or Rail Zeppelin as it was known in English. With a lightweight aluminium body, two conjoined BMW 4 six-cylinder engines, and a streamlined design, the Rail Zeppelin managed to achieve the thrilling speed of 230.2 km an hour, setting the rail speed record which it maintained until 1954. While the design was indeed impressive for its speed, it, along with all the other propeller-driven trains before it, shared many disadvantages, primarily of which was the propeller itself. Because the wheels of the locomotive weren't powered, the engines struggled to climb hills, meaning they could only work properly on relatively level stretches of track. On top of this, driving an engine with propellers meant they were awkward to operate at lower speeds, making shunting them under their own power difficult. For the rail Zeppelin, it was extremely difficult to connect any other type of wagon to it, meaning it couldn't pull additional carriages should it need to carry more than just 40 passengers at a time. And that's not even mentioning the fact the propellers were completely uncovered and exposed, making them a massive safety hazard to anyone who went near them. The fact nobody was ever caught up in or killed by the propellers of these engines is nothing short of a miracle. Another concern with the rail zeppelin was the risk of it derailing on old or uneven sections of track due to its light weight and high speeds, similar to the aero wagon. Krukenberg's intent was for the German Imperial Railway to adopt the design, however because of the many flaws the design had, they decided to pursue building their own high speed rail car, resulting in the flying hamburger. While not as fast as the rail zeppelin, it could still maintain high speeds as well as carry more passengers, climb gradients much easier, and was capable of pulling more carriages if needed. With the flying hamburger being the more reliable of the two, the rail zeppelin was eventually purchased in 1934 by the German Imperial Railway and eventually dismantled for parts in 1939. Overall, propeller-driven rail cars did have some potential, as not only were they fairly fast, but their light weight also meant they were fairly cheap on resources compared to contemporary steam and diesel powered alternatives. However, their incompatibility with other rolling stock, inability to climb hills or safely traverse uneven rails, and the outright danger of having an exposed propeller in the general vicinity of crowded platforms made them much more trouble than they were worth. Perhaps then powering trains using aeroplane propellers was a silly idea. The real solution was to use aeroplane jet engines instead. So, strapping a propeller to a railway carriage does in fact make it go very fast, but is also very inefficient in the long term. Plus, an uncovered metal blade spinning at about 2,500 RPM at the same height as a person is also probably not a safe idea either. Propeller-powered rail vehicles very quickly came and went. However, with the invention of jet engines, it wasn't long before someone got the bright idea to strap a few thrusters onto a train and let her rip. One of the first engines to be jet-propelled was the M497, built by the New York Central Railroad in 1966. 
Nicknamed the Black Beetle by the press, all it really was was a bud rail diesel car with streamlining fitted to the front and two General Electric J47-19 jet engines fitted to the roof. The same type of jet engine that was used as boosters on the Convair B36 Peacemaker Intercontinental Bomber, which for reference had a max speed of nearly 435 miles an hour. It was tested between Butler, Indiana and Stryker, Ohio, managing to hit 183 miles an hour on the 23rd of July 1966, a speed record that still stands today. Despite its speed and how relatively cheap it was to build, the project wasn't considered commercially viable, and the engine was put to the side, having its jets removed and being put back into standard commuter service. Later, while experimenting with linear induction motors and gas turbine-powered engines, Garrett Air Research built the Linear Induction Motor Research Vehicle, or LIMRV as it was known, as part of an ongoing project to experiment with and develop hovertrains. There's an awful lot of sciencey stuff to do with lift and friction and all kinds of motors, engines and doodads around the project, but simply put, the engine ran on standard gauge rails to test the effectiveness of using linear induction motors. On its own, during testing, it managed to hit a speed of 187.9 miles an hour, but due to the short length of the track it was tested on, it didn't have much time to accelerate to its top speed. To get around this, two Pratt & Whitney J52 engines were fitted to improve the vehicle's acceleration. After accelerating, the jets would be throttled down to only produce the same amount of thrust as they did drag, so as to not affect the overall results of the vehicle's speed tests. It was during one of these tests that, once up to speed, it managed to travel at 255.7 miles an hour, achieving a world speed record for conventional rail vehicles. Meanwhile, in 1970, the USSR wanted to develop the design for an electric train that could run at 200 kilometers an hour. Part of the development required a way of testing different bogies and wheel sets on the railways without them being motorized. As the USSR didn't have any rolling stock that could maintain a speed of 200 kilometers an hour at the time, they decided to fit two AI turbojet engines to the motorhead car of an ER-22 electric train, and added additional streamlining to the car's front. This way, different unpowered wheels or bogies could be easily swapped out and tested, with the jets providing the power needed to move the vehicle along. Known as the high-speed laboratory car, it played a significant role in the designing and development of the RT-200 passenger cars and the electric multiple unit ER-200s. In the February of 1972, it managed to reach 249 kilometers an hour. While not exactly a worldwide speed record, as the USSR used slightly wider than average tracks, it was still an impressive speed for the time. By 1975, the experiments were concluded and the high-speed laboratory car was no longer needed. It was left at Doroshika Station, where it remained parked for over 30 years. Plans to move it to a museum in St. Petersburg were made in the late 90s, but due to the poor condition of the car, it was decided that it would just stay where it was. In 2008, the front end of the car was cut off, painted, and installed as a steel to mark the 110th anniversary of the carriage works where it was built. You've probably noticed by now that out of the three examples of experimental jet-powered trains I've shown, only one of them was ever really intended for passenger use. The reason for this is because powering or adding a jet to a locomotive is simply just inefficient, and most engineers knew this. As stated previously when I spoke about propeller-powered carriages, vehicles driven by jet or propeller propulsion possess great speed capabilities but lack the necessary power to pull additional carriages too, severely limiting their carrying capacity. On top of this, they also lack the power needed to climb steep gradients, and as a result can only really traverse nearly perfectly flat rails. Traveling at slower speeds or shunting under their own power is also very difficult if the car is solely jet-driven, not to mention the noise jet engines make and how disruptive they would be for both passengers and the surrounding areas they would pass through. An argument could be made that powering the wheels of the car conventionally and having the jets fitted for extra bursts of speed is more viable, but given how much fuel jet engines use in comparison to a standard diesel electric engine, it just makes more sense to put more power to the wheels rather than fitting jets. So, overall, most carriages fitted with jets weren't really built for commercial use on public railways, but rather to help figure a few things out along the way while developing locomotive power. While it's most certainly impractical to just strap a jet engine to a locomotive, you have to admit, just looking at it makes you feel a need. A need for speed.
During the London Underground's construction, attention was turned away from the building of the tunnels to what engines would run the line. Diesel was practically non-existent at the time and electric trains were still being developed and so steam locomotives would have to do the job. The problem was, however, steam locomotives exhaust a lot of steam and smoke, not something you would want in an enclosed environment. To get around this, John Fowler came up with a design that would solve this problem. The only issue was, it may have almost been a bomb too. Fowler's idea was relatively simple. Make it so the boiler could build up and maintain enough pressure so that it could complete its journey before running out of steam. To do this, the engine was fitted with a large number of fire bricks to act as a heat reservoir. The engine could be fired and ran conventionally outside of the tunnels, and when hot enough, dampeners could be closed to stop smoke and steam from escaping, with the hot fire bricks heating up the water in the boiler to produce the steam needed to drive the engine. Steam would also be recondensed and fed back into the boiler instead of exhausted, not only helping keep the boiler topped up, but also helping maintain the heat of the water in the boiler. The engine was built for broad gauge tracks and was completed in 1861. As the underground wasn't completed yet, it was trialled on the Great Western Railway around Hanwell Station. And to make a long story short, it was a disaster waiting to happen. Not only did the condenser fail to properly condense any of the steam, but the engine's boiler pressure quickly dropped. On top of this, the the boiler feed pumps kept on jamming, meaning no water was being fed to the boiler. Here's a quick science lesson. If a pressurized container gets too hot, which is what a boiler is, the air inside it will expand, and with nowhere to go, will cause the boiler to eventually explode. Water in the boiler usually keeps it safe enough, however if the water runs dry, there's a good chance it might go bang. It has happened many times that an engine's boiler has run dry, so to stop it from exploding, the fireman can simply drop the fire out of the bottom of the firebox. No fire, no heat. No no more heat, the boiler cools down, no explosion. So when the feed pumps jammed on Fowler's engine, the fireman quickly dropped the fire to prevent the boiler from getting any hotter. However, to his horror, he found that the very hot fire bricks could not be dropped and were still heating the boiler. With the fire gone, all the driver and fireman could do was pray the boiler didn't go bang. By some miracle, it didn't. It was trialled again between King's Cross and Edgware Road, but seemed to have performed just as poorly. By February of 1865, the engine was put up for sale and purchased with the intent of rebuilding it in standard gauge. The rebuild never happened, and as a result, the engine was scrapped in 1894. The engine was noted as a fine, sturdy creation, but the trouble was her boiler not only refrained from producing smoke, it produced very little steam either. The story of the engine and its trials were kept relatively secret for many years, apparently being covered up, leading many to nickname it Fowler's Ghost. Most Metropolitan steam engines ended up using a similar method to reduce the amount of smoke and steam they emitted while underground, where steam would be condensed and fed back into the water tanks, with the water tanks gradually heating up, acting somewhat as a heat reservoir for the boiler. Overall, Fowler's Ghost was one of those ideas that's great on paper, but grim in practice. Regardless of its failure, it did help point designers in the right direction when it came to developing future metro engines and fireless locomotives. All the same though, let this be a lesson to double check your designs, just so you know you're building an engine, not an explosion. After the Second World War, the attitude towards steam locomotives was starting to change. People were starting to realise how labour-intensive they were to maintain and operate in comparison to emerging diesel and electric engines. As such, when the UK's railways were nationalised in 1948, it soon became a priority for British Rail to shift from using steam power to diesel-electric, and by 1955, modernisation plans were put in place to speed along the process. Southern Railways was one of the four companies prior to nationalisation that had considered the longevity of steam locomotives, so when their chief designer, Oliver Bullied, was tasked with designing a new steam locomotive for freight and passenger work, he decided to try and give it all the comforts of modern diesels and electric engines, and ended up with something… unusual. Bully took inspiration from his Q1s that he built during the war, which proved to be lightweight and easy to maintain. He also considered the advantages diesel locomotives had over steam, such as a cab at either end removing the need for turntables, and the engine being mounted on articulated bogies rather than having wheels fixed to the frames, allowing them to negotiate tighter curves. After Bully finalised the design, construction began at Brighton Railway Works in 1946. 
The end result looked something like this. Nope, your eyes do not deceive you, that is a steam locomotive. On top of having a cab at either end and sitting on articulated bogies, the boiler could hit 280 psi and was mounted to one side of the frames, leaving hallway space inside for the crew to move from one end of the locomotive to the other without having to get out. The bogies could be interchanged with new ones should a fault occur, making them easier to repair should they break, and the steel casing meant the engine could be pulled through a carriage washer, making it much easier to keep clean. Technically speaking, because it never pulled a tender, it was classified as a tank engine. From here, however, that's about all the praise the engine really got. The first of the leader class, as it was known, wasn't fully completed until 1949, about a year after nationalisation had occurred. British Rail showed some interest in the project, but weren't keen on completing any more units until the prototype had been properly tested. While its quirks and comforts may have been appreciated by some members of the footplate crew, there were many shortcomings that made it somewhat of a white elephant to others, namely the fireman. The smokebox had an issue maintaining a vacuum to help draw air through the fire. This was because of a labour-saving innovation Bullied had added, a sliding hatch that allowed ash to be dumped out onto the track while the engine was moving. Ash would build up around the edge of the hatch and prevent it from shutting properly, causing air to leak in. The design of the firebox meant the fire was concentrated in a smaller area and the firehole door was offset to the left of the boiler, making it much harder to evenly lay coal into the fire. A firebrick arch was later added, but was problematic as it would cause flames to enter the cab if the fireman wasn't careful. The firebricks frequently collapsed into the fire and so were replaced with a cast iron substitute. This, however, simply melted from the heat and so thicker firebricks were used instead. What was worse was the fireman's cab was relatively cramped, only made more unbearable by the firebox occasionally spitting flames. The confined space also meant the cab got very hot, with many firemen leaving the door open hoping to get some sort of ventilation. The leader eventually got the nickname of the Chinese Laundry because of the heat and humidity that would build up in the fireman's cab, with some measurements showing that it could reach up to 50 degrees Celsius. It was also pointed out that the fireman's cab only had one door, and that if the engine were to ever roll onto its side, the fireman would be trapped, which didn't sit too well with the railway trade union. During a brief maintenance service, it was found that the engine's centre of gravity was shifted to one side thanks to the positioning of the firebox and boiler. The other side of the engine was balanced out with scrap metal, but this led to the locomotive simply being too heavy for some of the routes it was meant to travel along. The engine was known to possess outstanding steaming characteristics and could keep up with its scheduled times when properly fired, occasionally running ahead of schedule. However, it consumed water at a rapid rate, and its height meant it couldn't fit under most water cranes, making it awkward to refill, causing it to lose any time it may have gained on a run. As such, the prototype leader was never used in revenue earning service. Its valve gears were also prone to many faults, but I'm not even going to pretend like I know how they worked. Suffice to say, the leader was a bold step in a new direction, only to end up losing its footing. However, it may not entirely be the engine's fault that it was deemed a failure and ultimately scrapped. Many results of the trials were noted as conspicuous by the absence of praise for its impressive steaming capabilities, braking system, and adhesion to the rails thanks to its twin bogey setup. Some believe this to be because of various conservative members of British Rail seeing it as too revolutionary or disruptive of the status quo. By late 1950, the leader had shown some of the many flaws that came with putting a case around a steam boiler. It was harder to maintain, the weight was excessive, and the heat made working conditions dire. British Rail at this point also needed to consider its reputation, as it was still relatively new and needed people to put faith in them now that the railways were run by the taxpayer. And the last thing they wanted was for this experimental locomotive to chew through money and tarnish their image. It had already cost them nearly £179,000 and showed no significant benefit over a standard steam locomotive design. In 1951, the prototype leader and the other four that had been in various phases of construction were all broken up. The leader, despite its shortcomings, was a valiant attempt by Bully to reimagine the contemporary design of steam locomotives and further improve upon the features most steam locomotives motives lacked. Should it have been more successful, it's likely the leader would have prolonged the life of steam on British rails. But whatever the reasons, be it bias against their design from higher-ups at British Rail, the mounting costs of testing it with taxpayer money, or simply the many flaws in its design, the leader just didn't quite make the cut. A shame, really, 
as it did have some innovative ideas for its time, and certainly would have been interesting to watch in motion. Subscribe for more.